Microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations, and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening, and welcome to News from Neptune for the 28th week of 2011. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio, and when censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, which does in fact seem to be an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussants tonight are David Johnson and Ron Zoke. Our friend David Green uh, should be back with us next week. Our format will be to take turns introducing a topic or a comment or an outrage from the week's news, and the other two will comment on that and raise questions about it. We'll try to go around several times. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice as long as we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, Either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Today is Friday, July 15th, 2011. On this day in 2002, nine years ago, the American Taliban, as he was called, uh, alliterately, Taliban is a plural, it means students, uh, but the American Taliban, the American involved with the Taliban movement as he was uh, excoriated by the uh, administration and the media. John Walker Lynn, a 20-year-old American, uh, pled guilty on a plea bargain deal uh, after having been uh, terrorized by the uh, CIA and uh, charged with being in collusion with America's enemies, those people who did 9-11. Uh, he pled guilty and was given a, an extremely long sentence. He is still in jail in Terre Haute. Um, there was a very interesting piece, a very worthwhile piece about the Lynn case, about how this idealistic young man who was interested in Islam went to uh, first Yemen, then Pakistan, then Afghanistan before 9-11. Uh, to learn Arabic and to participate in the uh, Islamic revival uh, that was taking place there uh, and was eventually caught up in the American invasion of Afghanistan uh, and imprisoned as a result of that. His father, who is a lawyer, writes a very affecting piece about the entire history of the case, and it appears not in an American publication, but in the Guardian, uh, actually the Observer, I think, of London. I'll put a link of it, uh, a link to this piece on the uh, uh, website for News from Neptune and on our Facebook page. It's the piece is too long to read right now, but it is a uh, uh, an indication of what America has done in Afghanistan and how America has con conducted. Uh, produced uh, a war. Um, this is particularly important. The history uh, needs to be attended to. Uh, as Noam Chomsky said, there's a good reason nobody studies history. It just teaches you too much. Um, I had the misfortune this morning of listening to a program on WILL uh, in which uh, David Inge in interviewed uh, the um, American ambassador to Afghanistan at the time of the capture of Lynn at the time of the American invasion, indeed. Uh, he's just written a bo book about Afghanistan in its history, and uh, it, it's outrageous propaganda. Uh, it's stuff like this that needs to be countered, uh, and it would take um, a good number of shows of the length of our show today uh, even to begin to correct uh, the misapprehensions, uh, misperceptions, and misstatements uh, from this morning's WLL ra radio program. Perhaps we'll have more to say about that or, uh, later on because the argument about what's going on in Afghanistan has been particularly um, uh, confused, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, by the American government. So you're watching uh, News from Neptune, the Miss Prision edition. Uh, Miss Prision, not Miss Prison, uh, is often taken to be uh, 
reference to someone being wrongly incarcerated, and I certainly think John Walker Lind is, uh, misprision actually has a more important meaning, or has, has another meaning, uh, that's actually more important to this case. Misprision means, to, means a failure of an elected official uh, to take account of criminality. Uh, to uh, a neglect of duty uh, that um, uh, means that uh, criminals get away under cover of law. Uh, in other words, what uh, Mr. Obama is doing in regard to the crimes of the Bush administration right now. Uh, the fact that misprision will continue to describe American policy uh, seems to me to be inevitable, uh, but we should be aware of what they're doing. Uh, We'll go uh, to. We're, I'm, I'm happy to say that today, in place of Ron Zoke, we've been joined by the <laughs> by the spirit of Charles de Gaulle, uh, who is here to speak uh, on the day after Bastille Day. Don't mean to step on your lines there, you know, General, but uh, go ahead. Right. Well, I just wanted to call attention to the fact that yesterday, July 14th, was Bastille Day, and I'm kind of uh, acknowledging the uh, French Revolution and the uh, ideals that uh, it. Uh, talked about uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, and I think we've come, become kind of uh, ambivalent, especially about equality and fraternity uh, in this country. So there were a lot of atrocities committed then, but on the whole, it made the tyrants of old Europe tremble, and I think on the whole, that was a good thing. So I have this weakness for silly hats. And now <laughs> I will remove mine and talk about uh, what's happening in the Middle East? If you want Ron to put the hat back on, call the number on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, those four, call one number. Those against, call another number. That's exactly. Right. Uh, uh, the latest development there, the United States uh, is trying to punish Pakistan for not being sufficiently cooperative in the war on terror. So... Uh, Within the past few days, we've heard that the United States is deferring millions uh, of Pakistani military aid, about $800 million worth, or over a third of the $2 billion that uh, uh, had been uh, talked about and the uh, Pakistanis have been led to expect uh, before. Uh, again, they've not been sufficiently uh, cooperative or deferential to uh, uh, America there in uh, the war on terrorism. They're supposed to be our allies in that, and uh, they didn't report uh, Osama bin Laden, who uh, a lot of people think uh, they must have known about, and uh, uh, they're complaining about us, uh, our drone, drone strikes, uh, killing their people, and are trying to close down the bases from which those uh, strikes are being directed. But uh, this uh, shows that uh, they're unreliable allies and we need to uh, punish them. Uh, meanwhile, back in Afghanistan next door, Defense Secretary uh, Panetta has been there and he has declared that victory in Afghanistan is within reach without telling us what that victory consist, would consist in again or what it would uh, look like. Nobody has been able to do that in any plausible way. Um, but uh, he must have very long, long arms indeed if he thinks victory in Afghanistan, whatever it means, is uh, within reach. It's uh, been just around the corner there and uh, just over the horizon for a decade now. And uh, it's still there. The uh, Iranian arms in a a Iraq are a uh, concern, he's told, more uh, anti-Iranian uh, statements. Uh, again, with hints that we may be uh, called upon to attack Iran uh, as well, opening another front in the Middle East, uh, in addition to the five or six that are active now. The 10-year anniversary of the uh, American struggle in, the, in Afghanistan is uh, approaching. Uh, the UN mission in Afghanistan tells us that in the first half of 2011, it was the si deadliest six months for civilians since the war began, up 15% over the same period uh, last year. 
So uh, the struggle goes on. There was a long, uh, reflective, unsigned piece from uh, the Associated Press, Dateline Kabul, a few days ago in the local newspaper, a decade into war, no clear answers again. It says, uh, there have been victories and setbacks. More than 1,500 American service members have died. There's been talk of a more stable, safer Afghanistan and frequent obvious evidence to the contrary. The country's president and the United States share an uneasy relationship and it's difficult to tell the story of the past decade in a single concise statement to uh, which I say uh, indeed uh, or you betcha or something. So uh, with that, I will uh, quit uh, the okay. uh, Middle East and we can move on to something else. Thank oh, uh, final sure. point. The Gaddafi regime has been declared no longer legitimate. <laughs> uh, I'll bet he's shaking in his boots about that. Sure. But uh, anyway, uh, it, it goes on and on. Thank you, Ron. The AFPAC war is on the table, David. You got a comment or a question or a addition to this? Well, yes. I mean, this is a quagmire is an understatement of uh, what's been developing in Afghanistan for quite a few years now. And, uh, you know, what really I find amusing is of how there, all this talk about what a horrible uh, leader Gaddafi is and how we have to protect the Libyan people and take him out of power, you know, for the sake of democracy and everything. Well, why isn't the same concern that expressed for uh, Bahrain? Uh, mm -hmm. where there were pro-democracy demonstrators uh, in the early part of the year uh, who were uh, not just beaten by the police, uh, arrested and tortured, but also actually shot with live am ammunition. And when doctors at the local hospital treated them for their wounds and, and uh, other injuries, they were charged with treason and are currently awaiting trial. I believe some of them That's have right. gone to trial. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, and then we got the, the most wonderful democracy, Saudi Arabia, which is uh, anything from that. Uh, it's a brutal regime. Um, and, and then we have the situation going on in Yemen. And I mean, the, the very, and also let's t look back at Egypt here. I mean, uh, there was the retaking of Takir Square here just recently because uh, the people, even though they had a victory of getting rid of Mubarak, it seems as if uh, the same people, a group of people, are still in charge and haven't done little, if anything, to uh, really abide by the will of people. So, you know, all these pronouncements and actions now, military actions uh, against Gaddafi, I mean, this is very uh, cherry-picking, uh, uh, to say the least. I mean, uh, they completely ignore these other, uh, you know, brutal governments in the Middle East. Why? Because, uh, you know, they've got them bought off. And Gaddafi, uh, first he was an enemy back in the 80s, then he became an ally. And then all of a sudden they decided, well, you know, they're going to take him out. Um, I don't know the reason why they all of a sudden they decided to do this by backing uh, an opposition, uh, uh, which is dubious. Uh, it seems like a lot of the people involved in the leadership of the opposition have questionable ties to the CIA. But nevertheless, uh, no one ever doubted that Gaddafi was uh, a brutal tyrant. It was just a question of uh, why now? And, uh, you know, did they just all of a sudden decide that Gaddafi, that uh, Libya's oil was ripe for the picking for direct control? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I think as a part of the general Arab Spring phenomenon, the U.S. is working very hard to make sure that the governments that emerge from the Arab Spring uh, 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 events uh, are governments which uh, the U.S. is happy with. Uh, as Ron's pointed out before, the technical term for this is stable. A stable government is a government that does what Washington says. And so we need stable governments in the area. We thought if we could use these CIA plants and so forth you know, in order to, 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 to piggyback on the Arab Spring concerns about Gaddafi, then the result would be a government to be happy. I think the interesting thing is, uh, once again, how hard it's been. I mean, I, I, I've objected to the use of the term quagmire to talk about either Iraq or Afghanistan because of the history of those wars, but I think maybe Libya may qualify. I mean, we may really have a quagmire here in the sense that uh, they, I think the administration really did think that it could get the get NATO and the locals, you know, to 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 put paid to Gaddafi's regime really fast, and then they could say, okay, look, here's we're supporting we're supporting the Arab Spring. Didn't work that way, and, uh, and I think that maybe uh, that uh, is causing some concern someplace. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there's a. Uh, I, uh, there was one bright spot, I think, Ron, in the in the things that you mentioned there about the AFPAC. Well, it's hard, and I admit I'm reaching here, you know, for a bright spot. But the bright spot, spot, and this 
may surprise you, is Leon Panetta. Uh, Panetta is such a goof that I think maybe he's going to do some things that will be, uh, 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 that'll actually be helpful uh, to the anti-war movement, to the opposition of the expansion of the war in Afghanistan and, 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 and Pakistan. Uh, and the administration is worried about this. I mean, they really, I'm afraid, are in sort of an upper-out position. Uh, the, 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 they're going to have to expand the war a good bit, a real war against Pakistan, um, uh, or they're going to have to de-escalate substantially uh, in both countries. Um, they, uh, they don't want to do that. And uh, when Panetta is pinballing around the Middle East saying things like, um, uh, I'm quoting now from the New York Times account, he spoke openly of supposedly secret CIA activity. And remember, this guy was head of the CIA, for God's sake. They moved him over to the Defense Department and put Petraeus in at the CIA. So he goes off to the Middle East and says, oh, by the way, we've been doing all the secret stuff that we said we weren't doing but we actually were. The CIA has a big presence in Afghanistan. <laughs> you know, Pakistan was complaining about the CIA in Pakistan and about the CIA in Afghanistan. CIA is saying, well, hey, look, you know, we're just doing, just doing a little stuff, a little business every now and then. Yeah. No, no, big presence, says Panetta. Uh, a lot of bases in Iraq. Now, here were the argument about whether the U.S. is actually withdrawing from Iraq, you know, which we're supposed to, according to agreement. Uh, the Panetta blurts out the fact that the CIA has a lot of bases there. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. now look, uh, what's going on here? Uh, Panetta, even more, he gets to talking to American troops in Iraq and says, well, you guys are here because of 9-11. Wait a minute, Iraq. No, 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 that's wrong, Leon. Right, no, 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 Iraq, yeah. we're here because of the weapons of mass destruction, remember? Right. That were that's never what, found. That's what, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there's a problem with the, with the cover story. Yeah. But we're not here because of 9-11. Bush administration tries to, tried to say there was a connection between 9-11 and Saddam Hussein, but nobody ever believed it, and people know it wasn't true. Here's Panetta back. Hey, guys, we're here because of 9-11. Well, yeah. the problem is there's a deeper truth in what Panetta says. We're here of 9-11 in the sense that 9-11 was a counterattack to the American control of the region, the, con the policy which was being continued by the Obama administration as it was by the Bush administration before. So in a, as they say in the literature department, in a larger sense, uh, <laughs> Panetta is right by saying we're here because of 9-11, but that's a terrible admission to make because it's an admission that the U.S. is involved in an imperial enterprise uh, uh, concerning oil. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't want to admit that. What came through in the press on NPR this morning was his uh, salty language and uh, yeah. his talk about uh, Osama bin Laden and, uh, uh, you know, we finally uh, killed the bastard. And, yeah. uh, he used some naughty words, and that's uh, that was the, their big point. Right? This, yeah, even this, even this is a copy. This is the Joe Biden mood, you know. Right. Joe, old, old man of the people, Joe right. Biden. Yeah. He actually slips and uses an Anglo-Saxon word every right. now and then, you know. Oh, that shows what a right guy he is, you know. Yeah, right, Come right. on. Yeah. And Panetta, uh, Panetta, look, Panetta is not a uh, is not a spring chicken. I mean, uh, he's been around for many, many years. He was part of the Clinton White House. He's been in every department. He's part of the permanent government, you know. And for him to start to, I, I started out by saying that this was a bright side. The bright side is that he will screw up really badly and say, blurt out things that happen to be true. Yeah. Like that's, that's the best I can do on bright. Yeah. On uh, ex-ambassador Thompson this morning interviewed on WILL yep. uh, AM, uh, he accepted all of the basic uh, assumptions of the Bush regime about uh, the need to uh, fight on in yep. uh, Afghanistan. I thought it was worse so, than that. I, yeah. I'd be happy if he'd accepted them right. in the sense yeah. that he had said what they were. He didn't even mention right. they were accepted, you know, uh, 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 silently. Right. I mean, right. it was just obvious that, yeah. of course, we got to continue to kill people in Afghanistan yeah. for the yeah. greater good. Yeah. I mean, the same way the British did, so, you know. Uh, so he was a, uh, uh, uncommonly, I would say, uh, knowledgeable and articulate uh, present uh, presenter of that point of view, but uh, I think he's uh, fundamentally <clears throat> wrong and on, on, on the wrong track. But anyway. uh, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, we remind you that you are watching News from Neptune, uh, presented each week at this time by Urbana Public Television. Uh, David Johnson has joined us today. David, you've got, uh, you, you got an outrage in mind? I think I know, I know one you do. So uh, well, see. yes, Carl. And I'll, I'll just start out by saying I never thought I'd ever hear myself say this, but you know what? <clears throat> 
I miss George W. Bush. <laughs> and the reason I miss George W. Bush is because that man, I mean, it was so obvious when he was lying, uh, <laughs> it, and he was so easy to make fun of, uh, unlike our current president, Barack uh -huh, Obama, uh -huh. uh, who, like George Bush, uh, is also a puppet uh, of the corporate interests. Uh, but, you know, the guy's very smooth, and he still amazingly has a large number of people in the United States, and even, you know, some in the, throughout the world, but less so, uh, convinced that he's the man of the people, that he's uh, out in a, he's in office uh, looking out for our interests. Well, this whole uh, this whole dog and pony show, I'll call it, about this negotiations with the Republicans, the raising the debt ceiling, uh, you yeah. know, the cover basically for what Obama is really trying to do, which is to destroy Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of people are are going to disagree with me about this because the corporate media is portraying that you know Obama is trying to do yep. the right thing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the thing is, is this, um, you know, the facts speak otherwise, unfortunately. I mean, the thing is, is that, um, first of all, going back to December of last year, one of the things the Obama administration did was they cut the Social Security payroll tax from 6.2% to 4.2%, basically beginning to defund Social Security. Mm -hmm. Then they're, they're talking about how they're really doing all this to save Social Security, uh, how this is necessary for the budget. But the problem is, is Social Security is not part of the general budget. It's a separate fund that people who work pay into. Uh, in fact, uh, the government, if anything, owes Social Security fund money because they borrowed against it to fund these corporate wars of aggression in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and other places around the world. Uh, and this is um, this is a fact. And the thing is that why is it that Obama he's supposed to he's a Democrat after all? Why would he be wanting to try to destroy Social Security? Well, if you look at uh, Mr. Obama's background and look at what he's done, not what he said, but what he's done, because he's very good at get coming up uh, on the television cameras, making this wonderful articulate uh, speech about well, how he's going to do this and that, and he he does either nothing or just the opposite. I mean, this is the his mo. Uh, that I've seen since he's been in office, uh, and the guy is, um, you know, he's he is a a, a free market, uh, neoliberal ideologue. Uh, there is no doubt of that. He, the he he is shares the opinions of the most of the the Republicans. Believe it or not, he 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 wants he has the same agenda they do. That basically they want nothing. They want the there are no government programs whatsoever except the military and the police apparatus and the prisons, and not even those, those are privatized, but the, the only thing they believe should be uh, a government program that actually is the police and the military. So in other words, they want to destroy Social Security. They want to replace it uh, with personal retirement accounts that the, his buddies on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs can get their hands on. Uh, and just think what would have happened if uh, Bush had been successful in trying to privatize Social Security. Like he made a few references to it, but he couldn't pull it off. Uh, Nick's only a Republican could normalize relations with China back in uh, the early 70s, and likewise, corporate America knew that only a Democrat could be the one to actually destroy Social Security and Medicare, and they're trying now, but we can't let this happen. Uh, I don't usually do this on programs, but I, I want to urge our viewers to call Senator Durbin. Uh, you know, I used to yeah. think this guy was halfway decent, but I'm telling you, he's part of Obama's Deficit Reduction Committee, and he has been, there's been some very disturbing things he's been saying, uh, going back six months at least, uh, about how he thinks Social Security needs to be cut. But you need to call Dick Durbin, Senator Durbin, at 1-866-4, um, I'm sorry, 251-4044. Um, uh, again, that's 866-251-4044. And let them know. This, it's going to take a lot more in phone calls and emails, folks, but I'm saying that, you know, at least for now, that's, that's the first step. But we, the point is, is what we mainly got to remember, that this is all a big lie. The whole thing about that Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are basically hurting our economy. It's these wars that are costing us uh, $2.7 billion a day that's hurting our economy. Uh, there was just a recent study from Brown University that showed all the hidden costs of yes. the war. So far, we have spent close to $3 trillion, and those are conservative figures. They predict that if this, these wars last another few years, it's going to end up costing even over $4 billion. Trillion. Uh, I'm sorry, $4 trillion. Right. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, that's with a T, not a B. Yeah. $4 trillion. 
just think what this money could be used here in the United States to put people back to work, to actually expand Medicare to cover every man, woman, child, like every other civilized country in the world has. Even some third world nations have um, medical care for all. And also, what happened to all these jobs that were supposed to be created by investments in green technologies? I don't see any of that. I see the oil companies, uh, you know, still getting their subsidies for distill uh, for refining gasoline. I mean, can you believe this? Uh, with record corporate profits, they're still getting subsidies from us. But the point is, is that people, we've got to start waking up and, and realize what a lot of the what a phony Barack Obama is, and a lot of the Democratic Party. Uh, you got to understand that what this all coming down to is that the corporate interests have bought off our politicians. There's a few good ones out there. Dennis Kucinich just sent out an email, uh, which, unlike most of his colleagues, he basically starts out by stating. President Obama has, against all promises he made, just put Social Security back on the table mm -hmm. for, uh, for reduction of the deficit. And he goes on to explain what, what a, a big lie this is. So, I mean, there are some members of the Democratic Party that are decent on this issue, but in general, you can't just, the days are over where you can just go there and vote for um, a party uh, and think that they're going to basically have the same platform. You gotta vote for the individual, and the point here is, is that Corporate America is, is they're out to push us down to subsistence levels and we can't let that happen. And we can't allow uh, our country to be associated in a world with occupation, murder, and mayhem, and theft. Thank you, David. Coming from? Well, no, I would uh, have less to say, I think, about uh, what Barack Obama supposedly wants. Uh, again, we're talking about intentions and motives, and I don't uh, really know anything about those. What I do know is about something about is his uh, behavior and uh, his yep. endless uh, backing down and caving in in the name of bipartisanship and uh, compromise. And then he seems to be congratulating himself <laughs> uh, on uh, doing this for being such a, a uh, wise uh, statesman. But uh, I'd like for him to show some uh, back uh, backbone if he really is uh, into uh, uh, supporting the uh, majority of uh, people. Um, oh, such as FDR did, for example. Um, Barack Obama, the only thing I can see that he really wants is to be reelected. Mm -hmm. And the only way he can do that is by pleasing the Wall Street crowd. The people are going to donate millions to his campaign fund. And uh, the, in our system, there's no uh, escape. Uh, from that. But uh, Roosevelt, on the other hand, uh, seemed to uh, really enjoy and cherish the hatred of the, uh, of the big rich in this country, as uh, 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 they were called by uh, Will Rogers, I believe. And uh, uh, Barack Obama doesn't do that or can't do that and have any hope of being uh, reelected. So that would be my... Uh, uh, qualification of what yeah. you're saying. I think the analogy, Ron, of FDR and Barack Obama's is a good one, but I, I, I contend that they're um, just the opposite in the sense that FDR told A. Philip Randolph in particular, uh, the great African-American labor leader of the Sleeping Car Porters Union, uh, Philip, you've got to make me do it. I want to do it. Yeah. Well, Barack Obama is just the opposite. Whenever yeah. he's getting criticism, uh, from progressive elements of the Democratic Party, that's when he really shows his fangs and hisses yeah. back. Yeah. What he, in fact, is doing is telling the Republicans, I really want to do it, make me do it. Yeah. I think that's the difference. That, that, I think, is the, the kind of uh, invert, um, yeah. you know, similarity, if you yeah. will. It's just the opposite. Yeah. Barack Obama does not want the hatred of the rich. He idolizes the rich, and he yeah. wants their, their millions, if not you know, he's got right now. Barack Obama has over a billion dollars in his campaign uh, yeah, chest yeah. for re-election, and not to mention, think about this: when he, I mean, he's only um, how old is Barack Obama? I think he was born in 1960. I, he's he's not 50 yet, I don't believe. He uh, turns 50 in a few right. days. He so. turns 50 yep. in a few mm -hmm. days. Okay, yeah. so when he, if he does get re-elected, which he probably will. Uh, 
Um, even though I think there needs yeah. to be a, somebody in the Democratic Party like Dennis Kucinich to please step up and challenge you, if nothing else, to bring out these issues. Yeah. Nevertheless, when he, if he does get elected a second term, he's going to be about 54, 55 years old yeah. when he finishes uh, his term and can't rerun. Think about all those years he's going to have left doing countless corporate speaking engagements. Right. He's going to be cleaning Look at up Bill financially. Yeah. Look at yeah. Bill Clinton. <laughs> he's and not to mention starting his own foundation for Haiti. Yeah. It turns out right. that they ship yeah. FEMA for the same company that made those trailers for the, for the New Orleans Katrina victims where they were sick from the formaldehyde. That's who Bill Clinton's foundation gets to sh ship the these trailers to Haiti and people are getting sick uh, yeah. there so I mean it's just you know I don't I don't really like focusing on one person um, either for praise or for con condemnation <clears throat> but you know nevertheless Barack Obama I mean he, he's a symptom I think of what our system has become and that is and you, you're right Ron that most politicians unless there's someone like a Dennis Kucinich who by the way they've redistricted him That's out right. of a job right. and he's gonna have to move to Washington uh, state uh, to try to run to stay in the US Congress um, unless you've got some person that's been that has a very solid um, you know uh, support of the people behind him <clears throat> and doesn't have to spend a lot of money to get reelected um, a person running for political office at the national level I mean they're gonna if they don't have the money to buy television ads, their opponent who does take corporate money is going to blow them out of the water in the sense that their ads are going to be playing night and day every half hour and then you're not going to hardly see anything from the uh, other person and people it'll be it basically because unfortunately a lot of people do vote on name recognition. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think you're right Ron about the uh, uh, that, that the central issue here is not the, the personal psychology of Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not psychoanalysis we're after, it's political analysis. Mm -hmm. The political situation the White House finds itself in and, uh, is in fact a little complicated. Uh, complicated by the fact that there's no modern president who has ever been re-elected with an employment rate above 7%. Uh, unemploy unemployment rate above 7%. Unemployment in the U.S. now stands well above 9%, and as we know, the figures have been consciously cooked in various ways over the years, so that if we did it quite the way we did it even a generation ago, we might get a much higher number. Um, everybody knows what the job situation is in this country. Everybody knows that this administration was elected uh, precisely to provide jobs, and everybody knows they haven't done it. And they haven't done it because of the situation that, that, that David was talking about. They're working for that 1% of America that uh, uh, controls wealth and power in the country. Okay, now here's Obama with a difficulty. Uh, he got himself elected president in a complex and interesting fashion that depended upon his backing by, uh, the, uh, by Wall Street. Uh, and now he's got this difficulty of not having produced in the way of jobs uh, and knowing that a lot of the swing states and, and uh, marginal districts that he picked up in the 2008 ele election are not going to be there, and a lot of others uh, he's going to run into, op into uh, opposition in, too. Uh, so, on the one hand, he wants to institute the austerity program that David was talking about, that the, the, the derision. On the other hand, he's got to do something to get himself reelected. How does he do it? Yeah. He blames it on somebody else. Yeah. He pretends it's somebody else's fault. Look what the Republicans made me do. Yeah. The Republic, sure, he gets his austerity program, but he said, hey, it's only because of people like Ryan and Cantor and Boehner and so forth, you know, they're the bad guys. They're the bad guys, and in order, you know, in order to do something about the, uh, about the debt limit and so forth, I simply had to do what was necessary here. Um, well, that's wearing, as David was suggesting, that's wearing a little thin. More and more people understanding that it's Obama, that this good cop, bad cop routine uh, uh, masks the fact that it's Obama himself who wants the uh, wants to invade Social Security and invade the other entitlement programs. Um, the question is whether he can get away with it, and I go back and forth. I think half the time he can't get away with it. That, 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 that's just the, the, the contradiction of establishing the austerity and pretending he wanted to uh, do the right thing. Um, that's not going to work. Other times I think he might get away with it. Uh, I think there's just a chance that he will. Um, It'll depend. It'll see what they can do. But the result is uh, a political situation in which there is no focus in American politics for uh, uh, someone to say, end these outrageously expensive wars, institute a jobs program.
Nobody's right. going to say that. Rubick's yeah. not going to say that. Uh, even Ralph Nader says he's too old to run again. Yeah. You know what's going to happen? Well, I think a few people deserve honorable mentions, such as Kucinich again and uh, Bernie Sanders. But oh, yes. uh, there are very <coughs> few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, you are watching news from Neptune on the fifteenth of July, uh, two thousand eleven. Uh, and we will go around once more. I guess start with you again, Ron, if you like. Okay. Uh, in this uh, struggle, uh, twilight struggle going on in Washington, uh, are you on the side of those who urge uh, shared sacrifice or those who <laughs> shared uh, sacrifice. <laughs> are uh, into rewarding the job creators, which is the new cat term wow. for uh, the big rich uh, the job creators, right. those are the rich people who, if uh, on the trickle-down theory, if we make them richer still and uh, cut their taxes and so on, uh, will uh, provide jobs for the rest of us out of the goodness of their hearts. <laughs> and uh, um, who should be sacrificing here and uh, who not? Um, again, I would be less confident in talking about what Barack Obama personally wants yep. uh, than you guys seem to be, but... Uh, I just want to talk about his political situation. <laughs> right, right. Know, whatever, right. what Barrack yeah. says in his heart of hearts. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and... Uh, something uh, else. Uh, what can we uh, say about this uh, um, talk about uh, the job creators, which uh, they're all getting this terminology from somewhere. Is it Frank Luntz again, who is uh, telling them to say... Uh, job destroyers or job killers versus job creators and so on. I don't know, but uh, it's, it's all bunk. And uh, uh, how do you resist something like that? I mean, what do you say to people who, who use that kind of terminology? Um, it seems to me the government can be a job creator just as much as anyone else uh, can be, but uh, those people denounce uh, um, any such notion and uh, keep saying that we can't spend our way out of prosperity. Well, to some extent we can, I think. Uh, people are not buying things, uh, houses and so on, because they don't have any money. Right. And uh, exactly. how do we get money into their hands? This is the Keynesian insight, uh, in a sense, is that uh, we do need uh, jobs. And uh, as Paul Krugman keeps emphasizing, uh, one way to do that is to start public works projects and other things that will get money into people's hands if they're carrying out worthwhile uh, projects and uh, try to reinvigorate the economy. But uh, uh, how exactly we do that in the face of uh, all of this uh, rhetoric about uh, job killers and job creators, I don't know. Uh, uh, Paul Grugman is doing a uh, honorable job trying to deal with uh, some of that, but he seems to be making very little progress. Now, I thought they hit a new new high of craziness in the uh, op-ed of the Wall Street Journal, uh, op-ed of the New York Times this mm -hmm. morning, um, where uh, Paul Krugman was talking about craziness, yeah. and directly opposite on the page, you know, was one of the craziest columns I've seen in a long time from David Brooks, uh, yeah. which saying people just aren't dying fast enough right. uh, in order well, to keep, keep up with the, with, with the medical situation. Yeah, yes. I think he, uh, Brooks does make a valid point about at some point we have to become sane and relatively rational about the, investing massive medical resources into people's, uh, the last two weeks of uh, life. He quotes these two medical ethicists as saying that uh, now we're spending a lot of time and money in devising ways to marginally extend the lives of the very sick. But, uh, uh, and, so you uh, support Sarah Palin's death panels, no, is no, that no, it, no. Uh, Ron? Yes. No, well, uh, <laughs> again, did Frank Luntz tell you that that's what you should say? <laughs> uh, I don't know. He's getting that from his uh, focus groups, I guess, or something. But uh, can we ever arrive at a uh, reasonable public policy about the allocation of resources in the fa final days of people's lives? Or uh, are we going to just keep babbling that uh, human life is of uh, infinite uh, value and so on? So we're perfectly willing, or some people are, to pour millions and billions of dollars into keeping Granny alive for uh, one more day or uh, one more week, thus taking those resources out of away from other people, and uh, that's something that people just cannot seem to face up to. 
But uh, it has to be done at some point. I'd be happier with your, your, your uh, perhaps over-friendly uh, account of David Brooks' column, uh, Ron, if I didn't think the subtext of the column was David Brooks saying, now look, we've got to have all these people stop clamoring for medical care. I mean, people can have medical care if they can afford it, yeah. but we certainly don't want any situations where just anybody can get medical care. Oh, wow. You know, that's, yeah. uh, that, uh, I mean, what he's really talking about there is the problem, is the reason that entitlements must be, uh, must, must must be cut down, and uh, that's that's the, that's the real point. And he's he's hooking it into well, this question yeah. of uh, yeah, yeah. that uh, you raised. Well, I, I, the the, the uh, I do think there's something to be said for the notion of what an earlier age would call an ars moriendi. Um, the pre-modern age talked about the art of dying. Um, and uh, we have a thousand years of Western reflection on the art of dying. Um, we uh, don't want to believe that uh, we have any use for that art anymore. Yeah. And that fuels some of the uh, concerns that you're talking about, I think. Uh, so there are defi there's definitely work to be done there. On the other hand, it seems to me that David Brooks is less concerned with um, uh, improving our spiritual situation yeah. than uh, working for austerity on the, uh, uh, in the interests of that 1%. Yeah, well, I didn't read that into it, but uh, mm. it, it was ambiguous mm. uh, in a way. But uh, there do have to be limits and priorities, and some people just cannot seem to accept that. Well, I think a lot of times this comes down to uh, how good of an insurance policy someone has because, frankly, uh, if somebody uh, who's uninsured is going to the hospital, I mean, you know, they're entitled by law to treat them for emergency situation, but how many people every year die in this country needlessly because of pre that could have been uh, cured from preventative surgery or whatever, right. but they're denied that? Uh, surgery or treatment because they don't have health insurance. Yeah. Now, a hospital is not going to keep anybody alive unless they've already had their financial office checked to see what kind of health care coverage they have. Yeah. So if they've got, um, let's say, Cadillac health care coverage, oh yeah, they're going to want to try to uh, play on your emotions and try to keep somebody artificially alive for as long as they can because they're probably bringing in, you know, uh, five, ten thousand dollars a day on that. So really that's what it goes to. And I have to agree with Carl is David Brooks is, <laughs> uh, he, he, I know exactly where he's going with this and I have to give him credit. He's very subtle about it. I mean, I can see, you know, what you just told me about the article, even I never read it. I could see, you know, reading between the lines where he's going with this, you know, by putting it in those terms. Well, there is the question of, of, hel of um, uh, the, exp the, the straight at expense for health care in this country, and uh, that, that is an issue. But the one thing that would deal with the expense of health care uh, is a, a single-payer system. Yes. I mean, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. There's not That's even a question That's expense to Medicare, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, a single-payer system saves in two ways. One, it cuts down the vast administrative costs that go into the pockets of the insurance companies right now, and two, it allows a, a system to deal with medical providers, hospitals and doctors and so forth, in a rational fashion. When you go to the doctor and you need a heart operation, you're not going to sit there and say, hey, could you give it to me with 10% off? And said, maybe I'm going to shop around. There may be somebody down the block yeah. who will do the same thing for me and let me spread out my payments over another year. How about that? Yeah. No, that's not what you're thinking about, believe me. <laughs> and uh, it seems to me that what we need is the sort of system that exists, as I think you point out, Ron, in every other civilized country, um, uh, in every civilized country, <coughs> uh, that is not here, um, that is a medical care system that deals with the, uh, the, 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 the general situation uh, and can negotiate with these providers. We haven't got that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't recognize that this kind of medical triage is going on every day now in hospitals. Doctors are making uh, these decisions about who's worth saving in mm -hmm. view of the resources available yep. and uh, who's not, but they don't talk about it. We've got to talk about it and put it on a rational basis. Yes, yes, yes. and uh, so there would be a clear policy about it uh, w rather than dealing with the uh, current uh, uh, chaos where uh, a lot of physicians are just making these decisions uh, on their own according to their own personal lights about who deserves to live and uh, who deserves to die. Uh, that uh, triage of uh, uh, these incoming people is being engaged in there in the, in the uh, emergency room just as much as it is on the battlefield where uh, military physicians are making the same decisions uh, on the incoming wounded uh, who can be saved and who cannot and uh, 
uh, those that cannot be saved are uh, just ignored and uh, you wish them well in the afterlife or whatever, but uh, it can't be helped. Very good point on that, yeah. Ron. Is uh, I was I think it was about a year or so ago. I read an article about a man in Washington State who was uh, denied uh, a kidney transplant, um, or maybe it was a liver transplant. I can't remember which, um, because they did a, uh, various tests on him, including a DNA test that showed that he'd smoked marijuana at one point. Therefore, they didn't think that he was, mm. um, <clears throat> as they put it in their terms, that there were more morally eligible people for the uh, free transplants. I mean, wow. that is just disgusting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you talk about uh, subjective um, uh, bias. I mean, yeah. and in the, the ironic part about it is medical marijuana is somewhat legal in the state of Washington. Um, people can grow it legally and hey. uh, sell it to, uh, the, but they can only sell it to the state of Washington. Barack Obama's White House said last week, David, that there there is no <coughs> medical there are no medical usage usages for marijuana. Yeah, uh, no <laughs> medical. And then when people pointed out that this was uh, nonsense, uh, the White House said, "Well, maybe there's some." <laughs> so uh, you know they they haven't really got yeah. their ducks in a line on yeah. the uh, on yeah. the uh, in the marijuana patch right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, we have only a few minutes left. David, you have another another deal if you uh, if you want. If you got another theme that you want to raise. Well, um, you know, I'll tell you, Carl. It's just um, I've been harping a lot on uh, you know the same thing, basically that uh, the people um, need to start getting back control of their government. Uh, and uh, the classic uh, quote, you might be able to help me, who was one that originally said that people should not fear their government, government should fear the people. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is our politicians uh, are neither beholden to us nor are they afraid of us because they right. depend on their um, survival, if you will, and success on corporate donations. And they think that we're just a bunch of sheep anyway, that we could be hoodwinked by any, uh, you know, whatever campaign uh, marketing uh, slogans they'll come up with. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people are aware that you know that the uh, Obama campaign of 2008 won a, um, a marketing award? Oh, yes. You know, yes. Best I mean, marketing campaign that says of the year. A lot. Yeah, right? Best marketing campaign right. of the year. I uh -huh. mean, that says a lot. And, you know, um, I, I'm getting tired of analyzing these problems, which I think most people uh, are aware of to one degree or another. I want to know what, we, what, what is it we can do about it? I mean, I'm frustrated about that, frankly. Yeah. yeah, well, that's, yeah. It's, it's too true. Um, I wanted to mention uh, another story, a story that we haven't mentioned that seems to me to have some implications that uh, haven't been explored too far yet, and that's the News Corp story, uh, oh, yes. the, 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 the Murdoch story. Uh, I, one of the best laughs I've had in the last two weeks was the Financial Times, which I've said here before seems to me to be the leading English language newspaper these days. The Financial Times, when the story about the uh, phone hacking and so forth broke um, and uh, uh, Murdoch hurried to, to London, the Financial Times front page account misspelled Murdoch's name. <laughs> Now, that's, that's just too, that can't have been an accident. There's somebody in there late at night saying, hey guys, look what I'm going to do. <laughs> but uh, I had a friend of mine who was an editor of the Boston Globe years ago who did something like that and it got, it got through. So I'm, I'm aware these things happen. In any case, uh, the News Corporation thing is very, everybody's very excited about that on both sides of the Atlantic and, you know, how could these terrible people do these terrible things and so forth and so on. Uh, what worries me about it, not so much is, uh, is not so much uh, what, uh, the Murdoch Empire was doing. Anybody with, who's been watching it at all knows what the Murdoch Empire is and what it has been all along. I mean, there's no, no news here. Um, and the fact that they're shocked, shocked to find that uh, uh, something is going on uh, in ter nefariously in terms of their news gathering operation. Well, come on, guys. Um, but uh, there are a couple of things that bother me. One is that I keep hearing in some of these uh, moralistic uh, uh, denunciations of Murdoch language that could be used against Julian Assange. <laughs> that is when uh, both British and American governments uh, view with alarm uh, these nefarious practices by a news organization, I just can't help but hear the suggestion that, uh, well, yeah, you know, and WikiLeaks did the same thing that the Murdoch people did, you know? They got stuff that they shouldn't have had. They hacked into something. Even the word hacking is interesting here. I mean, you don't actually hack a phone, eh? You can intercept phone messages and so forth. That's what they did. But the fact that they've chosen to use hacking to describe what the Murdoch people, 
what the News Corp, what News Corp, News Corps uh, has done all along, uh, seems to me to there's something <laughs> they're setting up something here. And since the uh, Assange, the, the case of Julian Assange, the head of uh, WikiLeaks, uh, and he's still in custody. Uh, the case has been postponed. He's still in custody, uh, house arrest in London. I think we may see a conjunction of these of these trends. Second point. Um, the British liberal press uh, has been uh, a refuge for um, some Americans who wanted to um, uh, uh, deal with the fact that we don't have the equivalent here in this country. And uh, The Guardian, The Independent, uh, a couple of the other papers, even occasionally in the Financial Times, are looked upon as helpful additions to the tightly constrained American media. Uh, there's an incident occurred just recently regarding our own mentor, Noam Chomsky, and the Guardian newspaper and its sister paper, The Observer. They have a vendetta going against Chomsky. It goes back for a while in that Chomsky made them back down on a uh, story that they ran, an interview that they ran, and slanted in such a misleading way uh, that they were finally forced to say, to apologize to Chomsky. Chomsky does not sue for libel, even though he certainly would have many cases, uh, particularly under English law uh, in the interests of free speech. He simply says, you know, um, let me say this is wrong. Uh, but now they've done it again. They've uh, they sent out another young reporter, uh, the young reporter who had done the first thing that, uh, that the uh, Guardian had to apologize for, to go after Chomsky in terms of Chomsky's comments on Chavez. Uh, and uh, the, the misrepresentation is just as bad. So here we have the liberal press in Britain, in Britain misrepresenting someone to their left, uh, which apparently they're not willing to uh, admit exists. Uh, what, what, do you th what, what do you think of the what do you think of the media situation, gentlemen? <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, like the um, the guy that uh, used to do all the uh, coverage for Venezuela uh, from the Guardian. I mean, is interesting. I was reading an article about this guy, and uh, you know, he hardly ever left his hotel room. Yeah. Uh, and when he did, yeah. uh, all his sources were people that lived in uh, the, the uh, wealthy uh, districts of uh, Caracas. You know, the capital. You know, and this guy is supposed to be an authority. And then even we're talking about the same fellow here. He he's the one who wrote the article about Chomsky. Oh, uh, yes, the second yeah, one. Yeah, 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 the first yeah, one. Yeah. I mean, the first one, Carl. Right? The second, the second article, the article about Chomsky and Chavez. Yeah. Yes, the first oh, one's okay. written by some young woman. Brockus. Yeah. Her name was okay. Brockus. Yes, okay, right. okay. And uh, you know, and how he's supposed to be an authority, right. you know, author, uh, you know, a good media source is beyond me. And he's been doing this for years, and his articles have been disproven. Uh, Continuously, but as we know, and you know, any kind of corporate media, and you know, I generally like the Guardian. Usually, it's good coverage. And, well, exactly. You know, so I mean, this is, but you know, I've seen this for years now. Is that when it comes to you know the leaders of Latin America, especially the more uh, progressive ones, the ones that are really represent their people, like Hugo Chavez, uh, Evo Morales, uh, and to some extent uh, uh, Rodolfo Carrera in Ecuador, uh, they are just, uh, I mean, very, very uh, biased, and uh, you know, it's just. Um, it just amazes me that a good, and I have to wonder why. Why is it are they a threat, you know, a bigger threat than uh, to the corporate uh, system than uh, anyone else? I don't know. Chomsky kind of thinks that in some degree. Well, there's the old line, the old line, no enemies to the left, you know. I mean, the Guardian's going to sit out here as the liberal paper. It wants to be sure that no one is pu is puncturing its balloon. No one is, 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 is revealing their biases, particularly, as you say, on Latin American reporting. The guy you were talking about is a young reporter for the Guardian called Rory Carroll. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. uh, that Carroll. was, uh, a, a, and, and he was the, the, the source of this story, of this interview. Um, with uh, about uh, in which Chomsky talked about Chavez and was presented as Chomsky's break with Chavez. Well, it's not that at all. It's a careful, uh, typically typically Chomskyan analysis of the situation with a clear understanding of the American responsibility of the situation in Venezuela. Mm. Yes, in fact, in um, Chomsky's latest book, I believe uh, he he was saying that the only hope he sees is coming from Latin America. Uh, and these uh, various uh, democratically elected governments like in Venezuela and uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, and uh, Argentina. Um, and uh, I think maybe, Carla, might be also, the, as you pointed out before in the past, uh, the threat of a good example. Yeah, yeah I think that's true. Uh, it is interesting to read, though, Chomsky wrote, the Guardian Observer version of this, uh, his 
comment about Chavez in the case of uh, Judge Affionti, which is what started it. The Guardian Observer version, as I anticipated, is quite deceptive. The report in the New York Times is considerably more honest. That's, <laughs> that's John a Key, switch. That's, right. <laughs> oh, that's a switch, precisely. Both, om both omit much irrelevance that I stress throughout. He means throughout the interview he did with this guy, Carol, uh, including the fact that criticisms from the U.S. government or anyone who supports its actions, he means criticisms of Chavez in Venezuela, can hardly be taken seriously considering Washington's far worse record without any of the real concerns that Venezuela faces, the Manning case for one, which is much worse than, much worse than Judge Afioni's, that's the uh, Venezuelan judge that started this matter. So it is, uh, yeah, um, if we're talking about the news of the week and its coverage by the media, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot we can be too happy with on either side of the Atlantic yeah. uh, in terms of the coverage. Well, you have to consider the position, uh, the circumstances of the uh, reporters and editors and so on. They don't uh, want to displease the powerful. Exactly. It will shut off their uh, access and maybe even cost them their uh, jobs. And uh, I mm -hmm. think they are very acutely aware of that. I'm afraid you are right. And then one of the reasons that uh, um, we can um, uh, avoid the same conventional doctrines everyone is saying and tell the truth occasionally around here uh, is the fact that we're not beholden to those people. You know, yeah. We haven't yeah. gotten too many subventions from uh, right. powerful editors or sponsors recently. So. Where's my payoff? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We keep waiting. We keep waiting. We can take envelopes with cash in it. Come on now. Well, you know the saying, Carl, uh, take the money, but vote your conscience. <laughs> <laughs> Speak your mind. <laughs> You've been watching News from Neptune on UPTV for the 28th week of 2011. Our program is named in honor of Noam Chomsky. This has been the Miss Prision edition. If our program interested you, you might want to look at other programs heard regularly throughout each week on UPTV. White House Chronicle, Sundays mornings at 7 a.m., uh, Democracy Now!, weekdays at 7 a.m., The Big Picture with Tom Hartman, although I think they're changing the schedule a little now. I, we, I may have to update this, but weekdays at 8 has been its place. Labor's Worldview, David Johnson, the proprietor of, uh, David Wor uh, of Labor's Worldview. And when is Labor's Worldview seen now? David? It's seen every Sunday here on Urbana Public Television. Television, Comcast Channel 6 from 4 to 5 p.m. And we're going to be having a couple of uh, late night uh, specials occasionally, uh -huh. just things we can't show uh, before <laughs> 10 p.m., uh, uh, one of which is uh, Live Gr uh, Nude Girls Unite about the, uh, the union organizing of strippers in San Francisco, and uh, another one, uh, uh, a profile of a, uh, a political rapper named uh, Boots Riley. You're going for the cheap popularity again, huh, David? But it's I kind see. of a political message, so Carl, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can to get the word out. What can I say? <laughs> Whatever you have to do. Right. <laughs> Organize the pole dancers. Right? Also, the David Pakman Show uh, here Saturday, 7 a.m., Essential Descent, a series that's being shown on UPDV on July 17th at 2 p.m. That's Sunday afternoon at 2. Norman Finkelstein, uh, who is the... Uh, uh, leading American commentator on Israel and, and the Palestinians um, on July 21st at 1.30 in the afternoon, that's a Thursday, uh, Margaret Butler from Jobs with Justice will be interviewed on Essential Descent. That's here at UPTV. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Zoke and David Johnson. This and other editions of this program can be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook and on YouTube, thanks to our director, Jason Liggett. I can be reached at carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook, and I'm happy to receive your comments. And uh, inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you.